Hello, everyone, and thank you so much for tuning in to Opera San Antonio's Beyond the Production live interview series where we interview people from every aspect of opera to shed some light on what they do and how they help all of us bring opera to the stage. Um, so today, you'll notice again, I'm here myself. I'm without my, my amazing colleague, Lauren, Lauren Meeker, who is in Houston working on Vincansport and the Impresario uh, through HGO and the Texas Opera Alliance uh, so that we can present those at the end of the month. She's working super hard and she sends her hellos to everyone. Uh, and for those of you that don't know, I was inspired a little bit by um, Sandra Bobrinovsky's uh, Instagram this morning. Uh, we're both Canadian and I'm here visiting my parents and my family in Canada. So I, uh, I cheers Sandra Rodvanovsky this morning. I got uh, my own Tim Hortons, so I wanted to say hello to her there. We're here in in Brampton, Ontario, and I've got an amazing, amazing guest, and I'm going to talk about her now before I bring her on because I'm going to say all the most amazing things about this fantastically talented lady. Now, I met Tatiana Vasilieva when I first conducted, I did my debut in Opera Santa, uh, Opera Santa Barbara. And she played for me a production of Don Pasquale there. And then quickly again, we played, we did Falstaff together the next season. And then in 2015, the season after that, in the summer, uh, we were together in Santa Fe and we've seen each other every summer in Santa Fe since. And we had the great privilege of having her join us uh, in Chicago as well at Lyric Opera for Peakdown. Um, and I do have to say there, every, every, there are many pianists that me as a conductor, of course, I've worked with many, many pianists, being a pianist myself as well, but um, there are certain special people that come with, with a level of talent, a level of preparation, uh, and, and just a good nature, and someone that genuinely wants to do everything that she can to make the production better, to help, and she is the most prepared uh, pianist, one of the most prepared pianists that I've worked with. And I just think she is absolutely incredibly talented and she has such a great story. And, you know, for those of you that know, my favorite question to ask is always the first question, which is, you know, the story of how they got to where they are now. And I'm just glad and happy uh, and really privileged to be a tiny part of, of her story. But uh, she's gone from, of course, being born in Russia to coming to America which is funny, coming to America, and then also through Canada, where I am now. She also worked in Victoria as well. We'll get to that part of the story. Uh, and now she's in Austria, in Klangenfurt, as part of the music staff for the theater there. So I think that this is great. And what I really wanted to do for this particular show, or, or one of the shows that I was doing myself, is to speak with someone that is going through uh, doing an opera during COVID times. So I really, really am glad that that she just worked on the first production that opened the uh, Klagenfurt season is was Electra, and she was the pianist for that. So she at least she has a lot of insight as to what they were doing in that theater um, to make that happen. So anyway, without any further ado, the wonderful and the super talented Tatiana Vasilieva. Hi. Hi, Tatiana. How are you? Was that a good enough yeah. introduction? That was a fantastic introduction. <laughs> I hope you were talking about talk. <laughs> oh, my goodness. But I mean, I, I am just, I mean, you know this, and, and I've said this to you many, many times. I think you're one of the most talented pianists that I've had the privilege to work with, and everyone that I know says that. So believe me, you are really, really well respected in, in any opera house where, where I've been. For sure. Thanks. Thank you. Um, now, the first first story. I know, of course. I mean, I'm in Brampton, Ontario, as we already said. Yeah. You are in. I'm in Klagenfurt. It's a city in the south of Austria. Okay. Um, it's about seven p.m. here right now, and so it's dark outside. <laughs> and um, it's um, it's actually it's a unique place geographically because uh, um, we are so close to the Slovenian border. We're so close to the Italian border. So it's like where the Germanic, the Latin, and the Slavic Europe's come together in one in one spot. And it's a very very beautiful city. We're on on the shore of this lake, Lake Worth, so Vertezi, as they say mm -hmm. here. And one of the one of the things this lake is known for is um, uh, Mahler has a composing cabin. Mm -hmm. Composing cut on it. So he wrote some of his most 
famous works here, including his Fifth Symphony and other things. So he's it's a very it's a beautiful place where composers used to spend their summers and draw inspiration upon and um, uh, just to literally, I would say, a 45 minute bike ride away, because mm -hmm. <laughs> I measure my distances here in bike rides, um, is the city of Perchach. It's also on the lake, and that's where Brahms spent um, two or three summers in a row there and also wrote his second symphony, wrote his oh, violin. Right. So it's it's a very picturesque place and a place with a lot of musical history, too. Oh, that's beautiful. I mean, I'm always jealous when Tatiana says, I'm just going to go to Italy to get a pizza. This is this is the thing that makes me the most <laughs> jealous, yeah. aside from all the beautiful pictures that I get sent. But but the very first, I need to ask this because I think we need, we have so many things to get through. The, and you have such an interesting, unique story from the countries that you came from and traveled through and have worked through. If you could just take us through sort of how you started to play, how, you know, it doesn't matter, in St. Petersburg and then through uh, coming to America. And, I, and of course, I know Eastman and then to Victoria and all of that. If you can just give us a little bit of, of how you started out as a musician, I we'd love to hear that. Yeah, of course. Um, I, mean, I grew up, as you said, in Russia. In I was born and raised in St. Petersburg. Mm -hmm. And um, from the very young age, my uh, my parents, my grandparents always had a subscri subscription to the, the St. Petersburg Phil. Phil Philharmonic Orchestra. So from like the age of four, I was going to regular concerts and I probably- Who were the conductors? A, Do you remember? No, because I was four years old and I probably slept to some of the most legendary <laughs> performances there as a kid. But I, I was definitely exposed to a lot of great music from early on. And around age six, I started taking piano lessons. And um, a, at the age of 12, my family, my immediate family, we immigrated to to you to us uh, first uh, after a brief stint in new york mm -hmm. then we moved uh, to seattle and that's where we settled in seattle washington right. um and so in seattle i continued to take piano lessons as well and um kind of without any kind of major goals in mind but just i was was serious about it and uh when the time came i applied for undergraduate um, and got into eastman school of music so that's were where you I got doing my... any collaborative stuff before that like were you playing for singers in high school or anything or was it always solo, yeah, solo very, uh, here and there playing for some people in our choir things like that but never never really thinking that that would be a career of any sort right um, uh, and then i did start my undergraduate in solo piano so it was piano performance and uh, throughout all of that, throughout my undergrad, I realized more and more as I was working with more of my instrumental and vocal colleagues that mm -hmm. it was way more fun to do just because, right? I mean, I mean, one needs to perfect their own craft and one needs to be a really good pianist to do this. But um, at the end of the day, after you spent, you know, five, six hours alone in the practice room, you realize mm -hmm. that you really need somebody else to play off of to draw upon energy and just to, to have this kind of interaction and yep. it just it's, there's still so, so much more joy in working with somebody else and so by when i was um when the time came to apply for masters um mm -hmm. master programs i i knew that i wanted to be in a collab field um yet focus on bullet company but uh, both mm -hmm. uh, instrumental and vocal and chamber music and things like that and oh, fantastic um, and I've, uh, after applying to a number of schools, I decided actually to still stay at Eastman um, for my uh, uh, accompanying degree, uh, the study with Jean Barr, who's a fantastic, phenomenal mm -hmm. uh, artist. And and actually, I ended up getting both a um, master's in solo piano and oh. collaborative piano, because I, oh, I've always kind of, one needs to always have a balance, uh, mm -hmm. uh, have a chance to keep on working on one's own craft while still accumulating the experience in the repertoire of collaborative playing. Absolutely. And, and, and that, I mean, I'm glad that you said that because I felt the same thing when I, you know, pianist, I went in for piano performance, same thing. But when you hear the orchestra and you start to work with other people, I mean, I don't know, I guess there's still pianists that prefer to play alone, but I mean, that was one of the things that, that drew me to doing something other than solo piano. And it's yeah. one of the things that I feel when like a great pianist is also at the piano in opera rehearsals. We have such a great rapport, just the two of us even, that it feels like, you know, exactly what you said, playing off of each other and, and using, you know, each other's energy. And and that I think is is a big part of why, you know, uh, let's just say rehearsal rooms, uh, you know, it's part of the success of the rehearsal room 
is the great combination between the pianist and the and whoever's conducting. I think it's it's an important part. And and you know from how the singers feel as well. What we do uh, really affects the entire room. And I'm so glad that you that you said that. It's it's one of the mm -hmm. things that you know so people always ask. Why you know do you play solo this or that or why did you change or switch or whatever? But it's all about the energy and working with other people. For me. Yeah, and you know, I have to say, after more than a decade of just working uh, exclusively in in vocal accompanying and in opera field, I have to say, when I do go back to playing some solo repertoire, mm -hmm. I'm a way better musician now than I ever was. Uh, Absolutely. And, and it's just working with other people has made me a way better musician. Absolutely. I mean, you have to. I mean, just simple breathing. Just the fact that. Mm -hmm. Just simple yeah. phrasing and breathing. I think it's. I think it's a crowd, which is why I think. And I don't know if I'm going to get any negative comments for this, and I hope I don't. I think opera conductors make great orchestral conductors as well. Like for for that uh, for the orchestral repertoire, I think it, that that definitely helps. And I find that in you know I don't go back and play too much solo piano music now in the pandemic. Of course, I've gone back to the keyboard and and played through a couple of old things. And and you're absolutely right. There's no way I could like the way your fingers remember it. I can't play yeah. like that anymore. So, but yeah, anyway. and, yeah, we do, you know, we do so much uh, full score study um, yes. as opportunists that uh, now I can never play the solo repertoire without imagining some kind of an orchestral sound for every single note. Exactly. So, yeah. Exactly. So, okay. So we're at Eastman. We do yes. a double degree at Eastman. Yep. And then what happens after that? You know, actually, it was during Eastman with that I spent um, uh, one of my first summers in my, during my master's program. I spent as during in the collaborative piano program at um, Music Academy of the West in Santa Barbara, and that was a and that was an instrumental accompanying only. And I was it was a great program, fantastic program. But I was sitting there, and um, that uh, Music Academy of the West is also known for its vocal piano program. Yes, mm -hmm. and I was watching those vocal pianists, and I'm like, that's. That's what I want to do. Yeah. There, uh, you know, because I, I don't know. Every instrument is fantastic in its own way, but some something about the the expressive power of the human voice you really can't mm -hmm. can't match it with anything else. Mm -hmm. And and also just the the ability to uh, uh, to to work with with a variety of languages, to work uh, you know to to work on poetry, to work on you know it's just the the words. The languages, uh, the expressive power of the human voice, it's something, for me, it's a huge draw in vocal accompanying. So um, after that, I spent two more summers in, at the Tango Music Center in the vocal piano program there. Mm -hmm. And I think it was a huge, um, huge educational opportunity for me just in this mm -hmm. narrow field. And um, and so by the time I finished Eastman, I knew that, that was, that's what I was, was going to do. And um, I... Uh, uh, proceeded I, after spending a year um, after Eastman I spent a year freelancing in Boston but mm -hmm. then I joined um, the Florida Grand Opera's Young Artist Program for two years in Miami right. mm -hmm. um, so uh, and they have uh, not only uh, young artist positions for singers but also for um, uh, opera pianists and mm -hmm. it was a time there um, and uh, and after that um, or rather I would spend doing the younger rooms and uh, spent a summer at Wolf Trap, which was also a fantastic company, phenomenal company, mm -hmm. phenomenal trip as well. And after that, I was just um, a freelance coach, uh, ready to kind of take on the regional companies in US and Canada now, as well. Now, what I want, what we did want to talk about when we did our yeah. when we did our little pre pre interview talk. And I know you you can you can say got into this and that and the other thing. Now we were talking about auditioning as a yeah. pianist, and I think that this is something that we absolutely have to talk about. So let's just sort of say, okay, say you see an ad, and let's just say whatever for uh, at, you know Music Academy of the West or for Florida Grand or whatever it was for Florida Grand. Now mm -hmm. explain to us, take us through like from seeing the ad, and then you see what, a list of excerpts that you need to play. And and of course, for everybody that, that may or may not know this, we have to, the pianists, we, Tatiana, pianists, yeah. have to play and sing Indeed. all of the repertoire yeah. from the extra. So if you could take it from there, let us know if you want to even be specific as to the Florida Grand Audition or, yeah. or any other audition you did, uh, it'd be good to take us through and the amount of preparation 
uh, it takes to do that. So what were the excerpts you remember playing? You know, I honestly, for Florida Grand, I don't quite remember, but I, I can just say generically f for a variety of young artist programs and also then for uh, for professional companies as well. Um, uh, often what you're asked to do is a little bit of something solo just to show what, um, just right. to show the musicianship and where just where you are, kind of your calling card, if, if you will. And then oftentimes you're asked for a variety of excerpts that um, from different periods, uh, uh, and different st musical styles uh, right. that also incorporate different languages. Mm -hmm. And that's just to show your facility and understanding of various operatic styles. Right. Um, and also your facility with languages, um, because mm -hmm. you do have to play. And singing and playing is not just kind of, I mean, sometimes it feels a bit of like a, a, a coordin coordination exercise, you know. Right, and exactly. It, but it's, um, it's, um, it, it's, uh, it, so, so yeah, you have to prepare. Like, for, for, uh, oftentimes the excerpts are, I mean, pretty standard, but they change from companies to companies. Right. I uh, often come across, you know, having to do the entirety of um, Act Two, Figaro finale. So not exactly. Just, mm -hmm. uh, uh, where you have to be a ready to sing and play uh, and uh, play and sing any part. Right. And uh, oftentimes, uh, opening of Labo M or the entire Act One. Right. Or, or Act One. Or, yeah. Mm -hmm. um uh, uh the quintet from uh, carmen yes the so uh, hard the 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 juice quintet or yes the, yep. mm -hmm. yeah or, or the, the maids or the maids from Electra. or the maids from Electra that you just did yeah mm -hmm. Indeed. so it's um uh and also but it's not just a, an exercise like well being a, being able to sh showing the uh, the the company that you can sing and play it's not just showing that you have an understanding of the diction and the style right. and mm -hmm. it, yeah it um i'm sorry there's a bit of some noise coming from our neighbors <laughs> <laughs> um and uh it yeah so it's um it's not just showing that you, you're you're able to understand that but it's actually a skill that you use often in rehearsals of course and you don't realize that it's um, you know, for instance, if in, in a rehearsal, one of the singers is sick, but they're still going through the staging, sometimes you're called upon to sing their particular line throughout the entire opera. Mm -hmm. um, make sure everybody else can uh, fit their lines around them and the rehearsal is not interrupted. Exactly. It's such a muscle memory thing for singers sometimes that they're, you know, remembering other people's lines and, and not hearing them in a complicated scene like in, in Act One of Bohème or the Carmen Quintet or anything. You know, the de toi, de vous, de vous, it would be so exactly. difficult. You know, when you have that memory as a singer, hearing it come from somewhere else is pretty amazing. We've got a couple of comments here from Veronica saying, What an amazing perspective. Thank you, Veronica. She works with us in the offices of Opera San Antonio. And of course, you'll recognize this name, Tatiana, from her <laughs> life. Yes, of course, playing and singing the whole thing. And she is absolutely yeah. great at it. But, um, so and, yeah, but I was gonna say so. It's it's sometimes you have to sing it in rehearsal, but also when you're working privately with a singer to prepare them exactly. for a role, mm -hmm. um, uh, then you sing every other part but their role to help right. them learn their roles. And mm -hmm. um, I've in, in certain auditions I've been asked to do that. Uh, uh, there was also sometimes you asked to do the Don Giovanni um, uh, septet and then mm -hmm. or sextet, sorry. Uh, uh, and, yeah, <laughs> and then uh, in an audition they would say, okay, so. Uh, can you do it as if um, I, the, audi uh, the person auditioning, am Leporello, and you need to sing everything around Leporello? Yeah. So, so, so it's a, it's it's definitely not kind of not an arbitrary exercise, but it definitely shows your skills at being able to work with singers. And it shows how well you know that scene. Yeah. I think as well, how well you've prepared that scene, and I know. And I know that I mean one of the skills that I mean we can transition easy from the auditioning. Uh, into what it takes to prepare for uh, just being the rehearsal pianist for an actual opera. Of course, you know, probably in our auditions as pianists for repetiteurs and, and positions like that on music staff or whatever it is, you don't, you might not get, um, you know, you might not be asked about all of the or orchestrations and things, of course, because you're auditioning to be a pianist and to understand the, you know, your understanding of the score. But I know that all of the great pianists that play in opera houses and that are at the top of this of this game of being repetiteurs, they also have an incredible knowledge of the orchestral score. So yeah. that, you know, like for example, when I'm working with you, I can say, 
uh, Tatiana, do it from the from the oboe solo of whatever or something like that. And and you know exactly where that is. And that's something that we train like as we're getting into this and, you know, younger pianists and stuff would need to hear that, you know, just doing, I can't imagine how many times it happened to me so many times on the rare times where I was playing at Ravinia or wherever, you know, where someone would just say from the clarinet, from the clarinet entrance or from this or from that or whatever. And you, yeah. need to, and I've seen your scores. I yeah. know that you have a full score on the piano every single time we play, we've played together. And I know that, you know, all of this stuff because your, your book is marked and not only and this is not for Tatiana, this is for everybody listening. Not only does Tatiana play what's in the piano score, which is already an incredible amount of stuff, she adds things from the orchestral score so that I'm actually the conductor, not just me, is not missing anything that might not be in the score. So really you do an incredible amount of preparation uh, in order to be in that room and to add everything that the orchestra is because you're the orchestral representation, let's face it. Yeah. You, yeah. Your job is that. Yeah, and what I what um, what I find fascinating about this job is that um, yes, you have to be an incredible musician to put the score in your head and into your fingers, and you have to know it. And then, um, as you're working with a conductor, you have to be able to read every tiny gesture or facial expression to try to get inside the mind of the conductor of what their what their musical version is. But on, on top of that, you can't react as you, the pianist, right. as me, the, the, the Tatiana. Yes. Uh, you have to react to the conductor as that particular orchestra that he he or she is about to conduct um, will react uh, to the conductor. And what does that mean? Um, you know, it's, for instance, I can, as a, a single person, I can react so quickly to a, a change of tempo or a gesture because I'm just one person. But if you're a 50 or 60 or seven person ensemble, um, that's also spread over a huge, Huge vast amount of space, space. exactly. Um, uh, it's going to be completely different reaction time, and also um, uh, people play react differently based on the particular unique uh, characteristics of their instrument. Mm -hmm. You know, if for and it's important for me to know that to know what instrument is in, is supposed to play every single line just to react appropriately, so that um, I. Uh, because really, I'm I'm the tool for the conductor to take and the singers, the yeah, and the singers to take to take and the singers for her and the singers to the next stage of when they finally are joined by the live orchestra, mm -hmm. and um, and I have to mimic that type of reaction as much as possible. Mm -hmm. I in some ways I have to be more of a Titanic than a rowboat. Uh, so <laughs> the, the orchestras, you know. Orchestras take a while. I mean, I'm talking to you, <laughs> as you well know. Orchestras take. Right take uh, longer to react. Mm -hmm. They often play with more delay and some ensembles play even with a more delay depending on their mm -hmm. size or just the tradition of- True, um, the tradition of the house. Absolutely, mm -hmm. the tradition of the ensemble. For instance, you know, as you know, it just did um, a peak down at the Lyric and mm -hmm. the Lyric Orchestra is uh, famous for playing really behind the beat. Mm -hmm. And I want to hear, uh, see a conductor to give a gesture for a chord. I can't just react to it, I need to, pretend to be that 70, 80 piece orchestra and exactly. play with an appropriate delay. Or for instance, if I know that this passage is played by, it's a slow passage and is played only in the strings, mm -hmm. those strings are gonna really gonna play. Mm -hmm. to, get, to get into the string. And so it's even more delay as opposed to a passage where strings or woodwinds that are much more rhythmic and fast, for instance. Mm -hmm. Or if I know that this particular note is a horn, a French horn, then I need to add almost like an extra second or two. <laughs> Play that note properly because it's it, that's what's going to be for the conductor. Uh huh. And, I mean, um, we can go down a rabbit hole of this forever. I know we can talk about this forever. Yeah. But now moving to this is another thing that I want people to know, uh, and and this is just just the way that you know this part of our business works a lot. Sometimes you play an audition and you think you do a great job and you don't get you don't get the job. Yeah. Sometimes you do an audition, you do a great job. You do get the job, but a lot of the stuff that a lot of the things that we get and how you've gotten to different spots and 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 myself included and everyone else is by word of mouth and and how you play and and all of that. So can you take us through like a, a couple of spots in your life where you auditioned and a couple of other things where you know because you did well here, you know this led to something mm -hmm. else. You know would be would be a good thing for people to know because 
you know, it's easy. I can imagine, you know, and I, and I was, you, you get, you, you get like, it's not the best news. You know what I mean? To not get from one spot to another or not be successful at an audition, but that's not the only way you can get to, to different places. You know what I mean? I mean, you're in Santa Fe, you're in Klangenfurt, you, you know, we've played at all kinds of places. Take us through a couple of spots where you yeah. auditioned and other things where it, it was another way that you were able to get to a music staff. You know, I have to say that um, uh, one thing about uh, coach auditions is that they actually take a long time uh, to audition. For instance, as a singer, you go into the room, you sing your two arias in 10 minutes, and then uh, it could go great. It could just not go great because it's only 10 minutes in, in that particular uh, right. you know, point of time and in space. And um, But for us, because we're asked to prepare so much repertoire, and on top of that, usually we're asked to do some sight reading in the audition, mm -hmm. and then we're also oftentimes asked to have a mini coaching session with a singer they bring into right. the audition as well, um, that when you come out of it, you you know that every facet of your skills has been demonstrated. Been tested, in yes. mm -hmm. So um, it's, in other words, uh, it, it's not like it's you never feel like you've uh, you've failed at the audition because you've had all the chances to show a variety of skills right. that you have and you know if they don't like it they don't like it right. if, if you know i if um and sometimes you just need to know what they're looking for and sometimes you are maybe not necessarily what they're looking for even though right. you're perfectly qualified you can right. be a part of a very high level um year or two year long young artist program mm -hmm. and um, at the end, learning that they take somebody that's less experienced because actually um, they feel like that person would benefit more from being in that young artist program. And maybe they feel like you're ready to take on the non young artist circle and work as a professional. Right. Or something like that. So it's, um, um, I've had a couple of auditions like that where I know I played really well and I did super well. And it's just um, they, mm -hmm. the different candidate. Right. Um, uh, but I have to say the majority of meaningful engagements that I've gotten as a non young artist coach, mm -hmm. um, I've gotten through just doing a production with a conductor or with mm -hmm. a singer or with somebody that represents a company and gets to know me and gets to know me over a longer time and gets to work with me. And then um, eventually that connection leads to some other engagement in a different company. And um, mm -hmm. uh, I, I've been very lucky because uh, I, I, being Russian, I am a Russian, a lot of Russian language specialist and a native Russian yes, speaker. Yes, you are. <laughs> Actually, that still has gotten me a lot of first gigs or like first time in this particular opera company gigs yeah. uh, that have taken me even further. So I'm grateful for for that background that I have. Um, and I, I, have to, I, have to, I have to say that really, uh, yes, one needs to be able to audition and have those skills, right. but literally... Uh, the majority of engagements one probably gets. It's, it's, it's such a small world, right? It's such yeah. a small world and it's so important. This is the, the next spot. Other than playing well, of course, auditioning well and do It's important that you're a good colleague. It's important that you, you do well in the rehearsal room and that, you know, you are able to sort of, as I was saying in my, in my introduction, you know, someone that makes the room better and like, yeah. like a pianist or a conductor or a singer, or it doesn't matter. Stage manager, it doesn't make any difference. People that make the room better get remembered and they get recommended when other things come up. And this world is just so small that that is an important part of what you do, uh, coming in and contributing in a positive way, not only with your talent, but with your attitude and with your, your energy and all of that. I mean, it's, it makes such a big difference, you know, especially like when the two of us are in or, you know, whatever, two people that enjoy each other's company, respect each other and work well together adds so much. And, and that just helps. I mean, it's the same for me. Like conductors don't audition. Yeah. You don't audition. You know what I mean? You, if you're lucky, you have a manager or you don't. And, and it's, I, it has to be based on, on, you know, recommendations. Like, you know, if, if, if I didn't know you and someone said, Hey, use Tatiana, I would call the last companies that you worked at and, yeah. and figure out how that worked. But okay, we don't want to get too far off topic. Not that we're off topic, but we always get into these rabbit holes when we talk. Um, so from Eastman and then from, uh, from a couple of the other spots, we went to Music Academy 
Did you end up doing opera stuff at Music Academy as well before? No. We have to get I, to the Victoria part because I need a drink of my oh, tea. Yeah, yeah. So, so yeah, I did. Those were kind of um, uh, young apprenticeships that I've done. So uh, oh, okay. I spent two summers at uh, Tankawa Music Center. That's where I did um, mm -hmm. uh, uh, the vocal piano program there. And then mm -hmm. I graduated from, from Eastman and uh, did a number of, oh, yeah, I did Florida Grand Opera as the youngest right. program there. And after I was done being a young artist, I was doing just a regional, uh, working uh, like at, at regional companies throughout the United right. States and Canada. So um, like Des Moines Metro Opera, Central City, right. Santa Barb, Opera Santa Barbara, where we met, um, mm -hmm. Edmonton Opera and up in, up in Alberta and in Canada. And, um, and then ultimately I joined the music staff at Santa Fe. So for the summers and I, I spent six mm -hmm. years um in santa fe which was you started before me you started in 14 i started in 15. Yeah, 2014 indeed but then in 2015 uh, an incredible opportunity came up um a uh, pacific opera victoria it's this fantastic mm -hmm. company in victoria uh that does incredibly uh, inventive things and they do fantastic yeah. audience engagement go and, canada uh, go victoria <laughs> Yeah, uh, uh, just a fantastic level of production as well. Um, they were actually looking for a, a principal coach and a music administrator as a full-time position, which is so rare right. in North America to be able to work as a pianist, um, to be employed full-time by a company. Mm -hmm. And it was such a, such a luxury and privilege to join the company. And I spent three years there, three seasons. So what were your duties doing uh, other than other than playing? Were you the only pianist that played rehearsals and things? I mean, I there was another pianist that was kind of a, 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 a contracted to do additional stuff. So okay. we would do okay. responsibilities. Mm -hmm. uh, so because I've had to do a lot of other administrative things as well, like music administration mm -hmm. that, has, you know, uh, preparing music, making sure um, uh, mm -hmm. the artist, uh, or helping organize various uh, um, outreach right. things artists things like that so there was a lot of um uh for, for every hour i spent at the piano there's probably more hours i spent writing emails and things wow. like that yeah you know it was a, it was an incredible learning opportunity as well to really right. uh, learn the, the business of opera from inside out as well mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um so it uh but after three years uh, in victoria um, my husband, who's also a musician, he's a he's a conductor and a pianist, and uh, uh, we decided uh, so that for him, really as a conductor, there were more conducting opportunities for a young conductor in the Germanic speak in German speaking Europe. There so, you go. Yeah, so we decided to make the big move to uh, to Europe, and uh, he auditioned uh, uh, here. There was a position open here in Klagenfurt, and he auditioned and mm -hmm. got the job. And, um, I was going to move anyway, but uh, right. very fortunately, uh, shortly after he uh, got his job, another pianist position opened up in the same opera house. Amazing. Um, specifically for pianists without any conducting, which is what I do. I, I, mm -hmm. uh, I, I love being at the piano, and I have I'm not using it as, as a springboard to any conducting career right. uh, down mm -hmm. the line. So it's it, it lucked out tremendously, and so we were able to move to Austria and um, mm -hmm. and to finally be together and be full-time employed here. I mean, a lot of people don't, don't know that. I mean, if, I mean, okay, we're talking about Michael Spassoff, your husband, who yeah. I love also, and is a good friend of mine. We all know each other very well. Um, so this, I mean, just saying that is saying a lot that we're able to be together. I mean, from the years before that, I know Michael was in different spots and was in Utah as well. Like, where like geographically how long had it been since you were in the same city oh my god it's <laughs> we were never in the same city that's the problem right it's kind of hilarious because um i'm a naturalized u.s citizen and i was the american living and working in canada in canada <laughs> for three years and he is a canadian i know he was uh living and working mostly in the united states and so we barely saw each other yeah. um and you know it's it's tough because our jobs are somewhat similar, although he obviously conducts. Right. Um, so in in unless you're in a really large city in U.S., it's almost impossible to to be both employed, like basically exactly. living in the same city. It's really Im almost impossible. I mean, a lot of people don't realize that it's it's just like being a singer. I mean, yeah. you go somewhere to do an opera production, and 
and you know, pianists that are freelance pianists or, or conductors, guest conductors and freelance, whatever, assistant conductors or whatever it is, you know, I mean, we've known each other for many years, you know, I've spent a lot of time in Santa Fe without Joni and, you know, vice versa without Mike Spass up there, or it doesn't make any difference. Yeah. You know, even when we were, I didn't, I didn't actually meet Mike when we were in, in Opera Santa Barbara either, because yeah. he wouldn't, you know, so it's this, it's really, it's no different, you know, when, unless mm -hmm. you're like, like you said, on full-time music stuff, but like to have two musicians in the same, in the same household that are, that do the base, basically the same type of contract work. I yeah. mean, for you guys to land in the same opera house is like, I mean, it's, one in a million chance. Yeah, I know. It's, it's really fantastic. And it's, it's a, it's a great place to be. It's, um, um, it's yeah, Veronica not, saying it was meant to be. Thank you, Veronica. <laughs> it's, it's not a life thing. It's about uh, um, uh, it was a, it, a little bit over a hundred thousand population. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, but it's a beautiful theater, and um, I can talk a little bit more. You know, like because generally in Germany and Austria, when you have your you know in, in an opera theater, you what you have is a Kind of a resident ensemble of singers that are full time right. employed with the with the theater, mm -hmm. um, who are cast in every production in some way. So let's say right. you, ha you have your resident baritone, um, he might do you know a, a leading role in one opera, then a kind of a secondary supporting role in the next opera, right. and then a bit ro bit role in the the other. But it, they're full time employed and they're constantly rehearsing, but they're living in that one city employed by the opera house, and that's sort right. of how it works. Um, uh, but sometimes what that leads to is, um, you know, you you can't get very specific about the voices that you have to cast as a as an opera house. Right. So you, it may not be the same type of baritone voice that the shows require, but you only have that one baritone, and right. you, so you not you don't don't necessarily get the most ideal casting that way. Right. Um, uh, unless of course you have a you know your Venus. Unless you have a big you ensemble, have, like yeah. five or a hundred. You know, ensemble singers. So you have exactly. a lot of various singers to draw upon. But this um, is amazing. The difference. I mean, it's just just so that everybody knows as we're, as we're talking through this, it's the difference between sort of the American system and the European system, where you know they do have and they're let's just say in in Europe, there is it is it fair to say even in Klagenfurt in in Austria that it's like you're a state employee because. Yeah. Yeah, so you're like a state employee. So you're like you're like a, a postman or a senator over there. You know what I mean? Something like that. You're yeah. on government payroll as an artist exactly. in that system. So you're guaranteed work. You're guaranteed what whatever anyone else in that kind of position would be. Where in America, as you know, we don't have on some. I mean, the Met, yes, of course. Or you know, if you're lucky enough to be a regular person hired and see, but we don't have. Uh, opera houses here where someone is employed at that level of employment mm -hmm. and and that much guaranteed work so it's just interesting to be i mean what's the sort of let's keep talking about that so that just so that people know the difference between the two things you've got an ensemble of people that work with you not just like i mean you music staff yes we have full-time music staff at a lot of opera companies mm -hmm. in america so but we're talking about singers and that leads to a difference in the way the system works. And I mean, I know we're not talking about like Munich or Vienna or, you know, 50 titles a year, but if you can talk to us about Klagenfurt and how that works, I guess with the casting, you, you have to use everybody that you've got there before you bring people from outside. Actually, having said that, the reason I said that is because uh, we are actually, we don't do that here. <laughs> uh, so you we do? Are we're a relatively small theater, so mm -hmm. it almost not financially uh, uh, of interest to the theater to employ this troupe of singers that are resident. Mm -hmm. and actually, our theater, the majority of the singers they bring are guest guest artists, like like in America. Oh, but, fabulous! But we are lucky in that um, that means we get a higher level of artists in some ways. We have artists that, for instance. The following season are scheduled to sing a particular role debut in a big house in Vienna, for instance. Right. And we invite them. Uh, they, of course, want to try doing that role on a smaller. Of course, of course. And so we get fantastic singers from all over Europe and uh, from from US as well, um, uh, that are you know doing their role debuts and mm -hmm. kind of things out on us. But it's they're at a fantastic level. So it actually. 
uh, brings the musical level of the theater is mm -hmm. higher than it would be should we have had a, a, just a resident group of uh, right. resident people. But also one of the things that I find interesting and that I hear from you guys in, in, in our conversations is that you get an incredible amount of rehearsal time and an yeah. incredible amount of orchestra time, especially like when I hear like 18 rehearsals or something, <laughs> on, I, I, it, that that's like enough for the entire lyric opera season, 18 orchestra yeah. rehearsals, you know? So, I mean, even if it's not the ensemble that's like that, the orchestra is definitely it definitely right. paid like that. So- And the chorus as well, actually. And the so chorus as well. Mm -hmm. So uh, that, that's why the theater has the ability to have a, a great amount of rehearsal time. And um, uh, also unlike certain German theaters, we are not a repertory house, as in like, you know, we have, right. you know, a, a rotation of 10, 15 shows that are constantly right. running. Constantly running, uh, yeah. We have somewhat of a stagione system. So we, we do have shows that we gradually work upon on, like throughout the season. Mm -hmm. It's just... Um, uh, the rehearsal process for each show is between six or seven weeks long, which is a, a crazy wow. amount of time. Yeah. And um, and off and we run. Uh, there's there's at least nine performances of each production, but that's those are the the, the least popular productions. Mm -hmm. uh, the most popular we can even have up to 21, 22 performances. Oh so my gosh! Performance, then it's it's in rotation then for two or three months. Uh, right. Before so we do have shows intersecting a bit because mm -hmm. once you know one show has opened, we, we're already preparing the next show, right. and it will have opened while the first show is still going on. Mm -hmm. So um, uh, here we're we also here don't do very many um, kind of how do you call that in English? Vida aufnahme, where it's like where just a remount, right. where you just rehearse for a few days and then. Poof, the show's on stage. Yeah, of course, yeah. We're pretty much uh, starting every production from scratch. So wow. we just, everything takes a bit of time. And, right. uh, and, and it's, we, we do a variety of um, uh, stylistic periods, uh, shows from different styles. And pretty much every season we do uh, a world premiere and we also do a musical as well. Right. And our orchestra is often involved in a variety of um, like symphonic concerts as right. well. Right. Nick does a lot of concerts, yeah. And and so, oh, oftentimes the chorus is involved as well. So you know if it's like mm -hmm. uh, creation by Haydn or Elijah by Mendelssohn or something mm -hmm. like that. So we have all of those projects as well happening that we as pianists are involved in as well. Of course. But yeah. so tell me when now let's. I just want to talk about this this these productions and what you were doing there. So tell me. I don't want to get over to the to the pandemic a little bit. Yeah. So. When this, when everything was shut down in March, yeah. um, what were you guys doing in Klangenfurt and how did that affect the rest of that season? Just, I want to paint that picture yeah. uh, and what happened over the summer, you know, when the, when the, when the opera house closes down. And then of course I know that you've got time off and then, but then comparing that and what happened and what you were doing and supposed to do. And then let's, then we can move on to, to talk about what you did do because this mm -hmm. is what I think is going to be very interesting for everybody listening is to talk about how you did mount and how you are continuing to work now. So where were you in, in the early spring in, in March and what was yeah. happening and how did that affect the rest so of your in season? March, uh, when the news of Corona closures came about, uh, uh, became, uh, we were about four days from having a world premiere of an opera. Mm -hmm. So, and all of that just got canceled completely. Thankfully, mm -hmm. since then, they moved that production to this season so oh, uh the the artists uh, the singers that were contract on contract uh thankfully will finally get to do it and all of their work was not in vain That's great. um and, and, but but once things closed everything closed kind of what's the word right. closed tur uh, uh, cold turkey cold um, tur closed yeah. turkey <laughs> <laughs> everything closed right away and uh uh the the city, except for you know pharmacies or grocery stores, completely shut down right. as well. Mm -hmm. And uh, for two or three weeks, we were like that. Um, right. And um, uh, fortunately for us, though, um, because we we're full time employees, we continue to get paid. So uh, I know that so can't be lucky. Musicians in, in North America, and 
Um, I, I know just how lucky we are to be yep. here. Um, and then we, uh, after a few weeks, we knew that basically the rest of the season, which would have gone through early June, had to be scrapped as well. What, what were the productions that were supposed to be done? So the world premiere, what was it called? Uh, Il Canto Sattrista. Oh, yes. Yeah. Yes, I remember. I remember. He's a yeah. he's a Italian <laughs> composer. Um, and it, it's basically the story of Agamemnon. But mm -hmm. uh, so it, it, we would have opened that show. There, there were still a couple of more performances of Cendrillon that were supposed to be happening. Okay. And uh, we were on performance six of our, the musical cabaret, which my husband was conducting. Which Michael was conducting, right. Yeah, we were supposed, so there were 14 more performances of cabaret that never happened. Uh, and uh, we also were supposed to do Romeo and Juliet Ballet with um, the Ljubljana Ballet Company. You're there. And, right. Mm -hmm. and, and, uh, but with our orchestra and everything, and obviously that never happened as well. Right. And a number of other concerts that had to be canceled as well with the, with the orchestra. Mm -hmm. um, so all of that was canceled, and of course, um, I have to add that our theater also does straight theater as well. We just uh, we as pianists are not involved in that. So right. for every opera that we put on, there is a matching play happening as well. Wow! So, I did not know that, or maybe I did and I forgot. So there's there's whole this whole side of straight theater is happening in the building as well that uh, got canceled, and I'm not quite sure how many shows that was. Right. Uh, um, so, but then. Um, ultimately, so the theater was closed mm -hmm. gradually throughout April and May. Summer. The, mm -hmm. In the summer, the city, uh, there was more openings of, you know, stores and things like that and mm -hmm. life went back to normal. Um, usually in the summer, we have kind of a, not mandatory, but like the traditional eight weeks off right. uh, in June, July. So mm -hmm. we have the usual normal summer vacation. Mm -hmm. uh, and... Uh, and in August, it was time to start the new season, and we did. Um, and wow. the first show of the season uh, was Electra. Mm -hmm. by and um, I mean, the, it, there were some major changes were, th that were incorporated to, you know, to to follow so all the. Was there like, what were the testing and things that you did? What What were the requirements? What was life like yeah. walking back into the theater? So after the vacation, after the summer vacation, the entirety of orchestra was tested, the mm -hmm. chorus was tested, um, and the and the um, arriving soloists principals for the show were all tested on day one. Okay. Um, we have artists that were coming in not just from you know neighboring countries of you know uh, Germany, France, Italy, but mm -hmm. we had one one arriving from Russia. You know. And you guys um, could all there. There was no problem with quarantining on arrival in Klangenfurt no, or anything no, like that. No, but the problem of uh, travel because it's just getting here yeah uh, was tougher of there's not as many flights right. and things like that mm -hmm. but um, once everybody was uh tested and cleared and th that took less than 24 hours um mm -hmm. we've started rehearsals and um you know anywhere in the building masks are required however once we get into a particular rehearsal space uh -huh. you can't take masks off um right as long as a you know a certain distance between one another is maintained. Oh, so you just had to distance, and then you could take off your mask. But, but you yeah. were you wearing a mask all the time while you were playing, or did you take it off? No, I could take it off too. But okay, the idea yeah, is because you're full, you're far away from the conductor and the singers anyway. Exactly, and I think the idea, and mm -hmm. I guess I think all of these um, uh, procedures would have been different uh, were we in a larger city. But we were so fortunate that you know we're actually relatively in a not so uh, densely populated part of Austria. So mm -hmm. even throughout the worst of COVID times, we didn't have as many cases. Right. Um, and uh, so if we things were, and then the, the protocols at the Wiener Staatshofer are, are much more stringent. Right. Um, but it, because, so once people were tested, we didn't actually have repeated weekly tests or anything like that. Okay. Um, it was just by symptoms and, or something? Like if you, there was no rules about yeah, you kind of isolate people in smaller groups. So right. you know that if, if anybody eventually comes out positive, then it's only a smaller group that they will have come into contact that would be would have been uh, right. Effective. And for this, so the staging, I mean, now we have to say, I'm going to show some pictures now of, of the production, which I think that it looks absolutely yeah. incredible. But so the because it's a Strauss size orchestra, uh, you guys were not in the pit you ended up being on the stage 
and the is action that, took place. Yeah, that was part of a kind of adjustment to COVID times is that um, to try to space out the orchestra as much as possible. And I still think the orchestra was not spaced out nearly enough, but they were all tested and they all wear masks right, right. until the point they have to uh, start playing. Right. Um, so mm -hmm. they, they, at least within themselves, they feel relatively safe. Um, so yeah, the orchestra was put in the back of the stage where, mm -hmm. and the stage is quite deep. So there was quite a bit of oh, room for them to spread out. And even with that, we still had to have a more reduced orchestra. Obviously it's only roughly about 70 people. Right. Um, which is still a huge orchestra. <laughs> I mean, that's, yeah, that's pretty big, but I mean, I can show, I've got some pictures here if we can talk through them as well. Yeah. I mean, this is what yeah. the stage looked like and it just looks like all this kind of duct work ended up being the the sort yeah. of set yeah. for it, but you can see the orchestra back there and I've got a closer picture here. Yeah, indeed. And so, yeah, the singers themselves were actually on the front of the stage where the pit is usually and we have our hydraulic pit that was raised back to mm -hmm. this and right. so the singers were on the front of the stage, uh, but they had to be a, min a minimum of three meters away from the first row. Right. Of, of, mm -hmm. Yeah, so exactly, yeah. So this is usually where our pit is, this whole area. Right, um, where they're standing right there is where the pit would normally be then. Exactly, yeah. So, yeah, as you'll see, um, we didn't really, I know some companies uh, right now follow a very strict isolation, like isolate every singer on stage so they never come right. across one another. Uh, we didn't do that. I mean, we they tried to not have too much close right. interaction, but close interactions cannot be completely avoided. Of course. I mean, then, because that's what we were talking about when I chose these pictures, because mm -hmm. sometimes it's like, it's absolutely impossible to have everybody, I mean, not absolutely impossible, but I mean, if you're in a safe situation, you can have people be uh, a little bit closer. And then I just this last picture was absolutely yeah. my one of my favorites just so cool i mean it looks so great i mean congratulations on on doing all of that what was it like in rehearsals when this was happening was there i mean did anyone feel like they were you know not able to do did it take some adjustment from all of the singers or the stage director i i think everybody was on board to try to to be as safe as possible and uh, um and most people felt relatively safe uh Sure. Just this kind of stage stage direction they were getting, and just how they were working together. So I think mm -hmm. um, really everybody felt quite good. Um, it's just sometimes you know where the let's say the, where the singers would walk out mm -hmm. on the stage past the orchestra. Sometimes they had to be reminded that um, they keep the distance yeah. a little bit of uh, from the cello section over there. And um, but it's uh, in general, um, uh, I think. I mean, obviously, I can't speak for anybody, but from what I know, people have felt mm -hmm. relatively safe. So, oh, that's yeah. amazing! And there's actually a performance of it going on right now. This very moment, indeed. <laughs> oh my gosh, that's yeah. so great! Now, I know that we don't have a lot of time left, but I did want to get to this because I didn't want to, have to say it, but I mean, Tatiana's pregnant. Oh yes, indeed. <laughs> indeed, Tatiana is pregnant, I and I've got six more weeks, and then we'll have our baby girl with us. Congratulations! Yeah. Yay! Um, <laughs> but, and then, of course, I mean, uh, you know, this is your first baby, and you're yeah. having it in probably a spot where you didn't imagine having a baby. I mean, like everything is so different over there than it is here. And I know you have a sister here uh, yeah. that's also pregnant now as well. I think yeah. you're second child, right? Second or third. Yeah. Yeah, but yeah. you, yeah, having a girl about the same time I am. So right, you at almost the same time. How amazing is that? But it's in DC, indeed. Yeah, but so, two but totally I, different experiences. It's going to be because, like, I mean, if I mean, we talked about this before. I'm not just surprising her with any questions here. So yeah. you know, I mean, talk about what you do there. I mean, like what you get to do there, the amount of time you get off, and and yeah. what it's been like setting it up and and getting everything ready with with what the Austrian government or, you know, what the standards are in Austria versus, versus even here. What, what is that experience like? You know, I have to say again, and I keep on saying is we're so super lucky to be here at this moment. And um, Austrian government is incredibly generous as far as maternity leave and all of the benefits that come along with it. Mm -hmm. Starting really like the moment you tell your employer that you're pregnant, um, uh, you become unfireable. Um, wow. And, and Indeed, there's protections in place that you mm -hmm. can't be, you know, uh, relieved of your duty, like removed from your job. Of course. Um, also, um, as it not, should be. 
you're not official like legally you're not allowed to work six no sorry eight weeks before the due, expected due date so you literally are you're on compulsory maternity leave eight weeks um before the baby arrives but the government still obviously pays you because mm -hmm. that's how it should that's be what they do yeah and also th this guaranteed uh, eight week eight weeks is also after birth as well it's eight to eight eight to 12 weeks after birth as well, depending on the type of birth and mm -hmm. recovery you need. Um, and after that, you can have up to three years of maternity leave. Uh, not all of it is paid. I think you have right. kind of, of course, for sure. government over and you can decide how, over sure, how sure. Much you spread over spread out. But that is amazing. Um, but, the, but what it means is that after three, you can, you can take up to three years to, to be with your baby and still return to the same position, and this, the position is reserved for you. Absolutely In fact, amazing. Four months you can for for four when you go back to your job, you also mm -hmm. are given a four month period during which you also cannot be fired. So they give you time sure. to go to get used to you know to get back into the swing of it. Of course, indeed, yeah. So it's it different practicing and studying. Like for what, what was it like being pregnant and I mean, and, and having to study and practice, I mean, Electra, for those of you that may not know, Electra is super hard to learn and practice. So, you know, yeah. it's, and it's, and I don't think you've done Electra before. That's the first time. No, you've done I have to say for me, I'd say Crazy. Yeah, it's, it's the hardest score I've had to play to date. Yeah. Is it harder than Zalame? Yes, it is. Zalame is way easier, I have to say. Okay, way easier. Let's not say way easier because... But it is way easier. <laughs> wow. Okay. Just, there's, um, there's some kind of under this feeling of just... Uh, 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 Electra is just much more dissonant mm -hmm. and it's much more, it's just much more fast and it's just so dense. And uh, right. so it's, it's about an hour and 40 minutes of music that just never stops it yeah. literally never stops and if your body doesn't get tired and yes trust me it does get tired I'm sure it does you reach like that uh, first hour mark and you haven't stopped playing really fast complex music then your your mind just starts to go because it's so right. dense on the page and oftentimes uh you have to constantly perform these mathematical kind of uh, right. uh, kind of exercises in your head of trying to see what's on the page but not play that but reduce it or you know change the orchestra like change how you what you play right um uh, because there's so many layers in or uh, orchestral lines and orchestra that you literally can't do with just the two hands that you have so you have to make certain sacrifices and uh, yep. you can't play anything and it's just it's just so unrelentingly fast and yep. difficult so once you finally get to the entrance of arrest and there's like oh there's a little bit of yeah of yeah Chords. <laughs> and you hold a bottle and like you hold the cord yeah. and you take a sip of water. It's just, wow. it's just never ending. Um, I, I, I didn't have to, I'm looking forward to doing Electra again for the second time because with Strauss operas, mm -hmm. it's always a different thing doing an opera for the second time. Yeah. Because once, yeah, once you've done it once, it takes you to a certain level of knowing that piece, even just yep. physically. It, it's sort of like running a marathon. You 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 just need to know that you can get through it and it's mm -hmm. never pretty even if you've been preparing for it all the time no right. nobody ever does a marathon and says oh that, that was well so I can you know, <laughs> it never happens that way so right. no i mean i feel the same way i've done a few strauss operas and but i've only ever done them once yeah. and yeah. i would really love to be able to do whatever we should do zalame together somewhere else or something again yeah. But um, I mean, I don't, I don't want to take all of your evening, but, and uh, you know, uh, this, this for me has been outstanding. I love talking to you. You're one of my, one of my good friends. We're always in touch. So this for me was a pleasure. And I hope everybody listening learned something about being a pianist, being a repetiteur. And I mean, I love your journey from Russia through America and Canada one that more was time. Indeed. And Canada back through and and for me, I just think it's great that when we WhatsApp, you know, chat, your husband is there too. I mean that that for me is great. And congratulations on the baby coming soon and on all the things in Kong and Fort. And I hope to get a chance to see you. Joni and I hope that we get a chance to see you soon. But thank you so much for talking to me and and doing this interview with us. And just have a wonderful, wonderful night. And I I mean, I'm sure I'll text you tomorrow or something, but I really appreciate all your time. Thank you so much, Tatiana. And 
We'll talk again soon. Ciao, ciao, ciao. Thank you. Ciao. Thank you. Ciao. Thanks everybody for coming. I really appreciate it. And we'll see you again in a couple of weeks. All right. Take care. Ciao.